Anthony Stockton. Hi, Angela Dawson. Nice to meet you. Graham. Hi. Jennifer. Graham. Hi. This is we different. So <laughs> yes, yes. So you guys are in the old Will, Will Vinton studios, right? Uh, not, not in the same building. Same, but but same, same, same city. Same family. Yeah, same, same family, family for yeah. sure. Right. Yeah. Cool. That's cool. Can I see him for a minute? Is this a radio interview? What is it? No. Just, no, oh. just nice They're microphones, that's all. So have you, guys, have you guys heard all about the rapid prototype printing? Have you been discussing that with anything? No, we just... We just oh, okay, no, good. I'll move go. him over here awesome. then. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think what was great about the um, end of the film where you show the, you know, kind of the blending of the... Mm. Yeah, that was Travis. Did you meet yeah. Travis today, our CEO? He's a lead animator. He was animating Pickles and Trout in that moment. You can tell which days he had important board meetings because he has a nice shirt on with a collar. And the days <laughs> he's in a t-shirt, it's that's when he's just animating. Mm -hmm. And what you saw him doing, manipulating those puppets, they have armatures in them where you can do it. Every single finger is articulated and you can move them. Incredibly, amazingly uh, machined armatures inside there where they have every range of movement of yeah. a human body. And then it's just moving it slightly, taking a frame, moving it slightly, taking a frame. Stuff. That hasn't changed since King Kong. The ability to make the armatures and the metals they're made up and the thinness of them, that has changed over, over years and improved and stuff. But, but that, fundamentally, that's what stop motion is, is making an articulatable puppet that can be moved around. Mm -hmm. It takes an incredible amount of patience to make those you know, Travis always, always objects to the word patience. Yeah. He says well, that is part focus. of it. But focus, <laughs> focus, yeah. ability to concentrate is, yeah, a big part of it. Uh, and it's funny with stop motion, it's, it's a weird crossbreed of, of animation and live action. I mean, we, we, have, we have stages out there and we have people like carpenters and everybody's building things and sets and lights and stuff. So there's a ton of energy, activity and noise that's always happening around the stages. And yet the animators have to be able to just zone it all out and focus on their particular shot in the moment. And so, yeah, Travis is always a big proponent of it. It's focus, it's concentration that's the big deal. Because it's a performance. The, yeah. how it's unlike, the way it's unlike any other form of animation is in 2D animation, you, when you used to get assigned your sequence, you'd do a couple of drawings <laughs> and say, he's going to go from this pose to this pose and this pose. And then you do a test, you shoot it on film or video. Then you do an in-between drawing between those. And little by little, you build up the sequence over a week, and you're showing it for the director. CG animation, the same thing. You go into the computer, you go, he'll be doing this pose. And then he walks over here and here. And then you build on it. So you're able to, after iteration after iteration, you build your scene very methodically. But in stop motion animation, you launch the animator on the sequence. You look at the storyboards and you say, this is what the character's got to do. You launch him on, he goes out to his set and he gets one rehearsal. And that's roughly where he figures out where the character's gonna move through the set. And then he does what you saw Travis doing, which is a performance. It's a performance in a way in slow motion. It probably took him a week and a half or two weeks to animate that sequence that you saw. But once he begins at the beginning of the sequence, he just goes forward all the way through. Things change. It's like it's like having an opening night with no rehearsal. Yeah, and you hopefully you get everything you need for the for the story to work. But sometimes you get something that's way better than anything you could have hoped of because yeah, it's, it's really a it's kind of a magical thing. Yeah, and we've joked that you know we our animation schedule is 18 months long, and so we have essentially 18 months of opening nights <laughs> every day. Every day. Yeah. yeah. Now if um. If I may ask, uh, uh, is there anything from the book that you wish you could bring to the screen, but you know, you just couldn't fit the story or anything like that? Uh, <laughs> the so studio that owned, was... bought the rights to this book 10 years ago when they started working on Coraline, so they have owned the rights to the book for 10 years. I went up there seven years ago um, and started to read the book and started to develop the story. I have written scripts or done story <laughs> reels for every possible character and iteration that you could make from that book. <laughs> so I've tried them all out. I think we finally ended up on the best story that brings to the screen the tone of the book, even though it's changed a lot from the book story. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was things in it. We spent a few years developing these characters that were a lot like the box trolls. They're called cabbage heads. Mm -hmm. These strange little characters that wear cabbages on their head with a strap and they kind of worship a cabbage as their queen, <laughs> and they're hilarious characters. And after six versions of the script, we had them in there, and we had this cabbage head, but the movie wasn't, didn't gel yet. It didn't have that human emotional story. It had lots of beautiful stuff, and Alan St Snow's mind is amazing for creating brilliant creatures. And there was lots of stuff to look at, but it didn't have any heart. And it really wasn't until we went back in the story, focused on the story of the boy being raised by box trolls, 
this weird surrogate family that's grown up around them. And then, in fact, it was our creation of Winnie, because she doesn't exist in the book. She's kind of, we compiled a lot of above ground characters with their prejudices and their preconceived notions of what Boxtels are, and we put it all together in that family of, of Winnie and, and the Portly Ryans. And when those two stories, the little boy and the little girl, started to mirror each other, uh, that's when it came together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, uh, when, when this eventually comes out on uh, like DVD and Blu ray, did you guys save a lot of, uh, yes. save a lot of stuff? Can you give us uh, any hints on what we uh, can expect? Uh, what are the, uh, well, some of the ones we've suggested was Tea and Cheese was the name of the yeah. sequence. Prior to the waltzing sequence, they're dancing. <laughs> Instead, Egg's first meeting of the aristocrats was he sat down to have a tea, a formal tea dinner with Winnie and her parents. And, of course, he doesn't know how to eat or sit at a table or anything. And we thought it was great. It was beautiful. And one thing that's nice about that, there's tons of Tony Collette, and she was fantastic. And her character got squeezed a little bit in the movie, and we lost a lot of her. But she's all over that storyboarded sequence, so you can see that. Later on, for different story reasons, we needed to change that into the waltz sequence. Yeah, I mean, the essence of what was funny about Tea and Cheese got sort of inserted into, into the waltz that we ultimately did. Uh, and I still think back to you know when we decided to to make that shift and turn this into a bigger fish out of water moment in the film and create this big waltz ballroom scene as directors I mean Tony and I didn't really realize the undertaking we were asking of the studio um, because you know uh, typically with each sequence in the movie we have a breakdown meeting and everybody sits down and everyone all the heads of department divvy up the workloads and we deconstruct all the shots figure out who's doing what and it's always Usually they're really energetic meetings. Everyone's really excited to be in <laughs> there. We're all figuring it all out. But we knew something was different the day when we sat down with the breakdown meeting for the, the dance sequence because the room was like dead quiet. No one was talking. Everyone was just leafing through their packets <laughs> and like nervously looking to each other. And Yeah, usually they fight over who gets to do what. And this one, <laughs> you can have that idea. You can have that problem. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, it took all 18 months of the shooting schedule to create a little less than two minutes of the dance footage you saw in the film. I mean, yeah. it was incredibly complex. And it used every department. Um, in the storyboarding department, we have a fantastic storyboard artist named Emanuela Cozzi. She story, we said, it's got to be a waltz sequence. And in the middle, Eggs and Winnie have a romantic moment. <coughs> and then Snatcher chases Eggs, and he's got to escape. And she came up with the ideas of Winnie and Eggs spinning in each other's arms. Um, and of eggs trying to hide under the skirts, all while waltzing. Mm -hmm. So then we had that waltz, and then we went out to our composer, Dario Marinelli, who has done Atonement and Anna Karenina and is, you know, knows a lot about waltz sequences and period films. He wrote a waltz to go along with him. But not only did he write the waltz, he wrote it and he was able to write score that made the romantic moment more romantic without losing the waltz tempo. And also added chase music for Fru Fru chasing eggs through the skirts without losing the waltz moment stuff. He needed to write that so that we could write we could edit the storyboards and get the timing right. And once we had that, Mark Stewart, our lighting cameraman for that sequence, worked with two choreographers from the Portland Ballet to reproduce the dancing sequence mm -hmm. on one of our stages so he could film it from every angle as reference for how the characters were going to move. And then the puppet fabrication department had to figure out skirts that could go along these ladies all the way to the ground because we knew we couldn't see their feet because hidden inside their skirts there has to be this slinky type apparatus so that they could squash and stretch the skirt as they were dancing. So every department had to go on it. And then we needed to find an animator willing and stupid <laughs> enough to take on that sequence. And we found a guy named Jan Moss who not only, he loved the idea, he's very meticulous. Yeah, I mean, he had all, every launch session with Jan was in, uh, involved looking at all his crazy little diagrams that he'd mapped out for exactly, precisely how all this choreographed movement was going to work with the puppets. I mean, it was like, uh, you know, neither of us are math geniuses, but Jan has always, had it always mapped out into yeah. the angles, and yeah. we just, we just agreed with him. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, of course, yeah, yes. <laughs> well, can you talk a little bit about the casting, the voice casting? And, you know, um, it was funny because a lot of people I've spoken with... Didn't thought, know it was Sir Ben? Yes, uh, they thought it was Timothy that's great. Small. Oh, that's funny. Well, part of that is because Snatcher looks a little bit like little Timothy bit. Small yeah. <laughs> and other parts that you've seen, which was not intentional because, in fact, when I launched the storyboard arts, I said, imagine if you took Zero Mistel and Tiny Tim. Probably some people are too young to remember Tiny, Tiny Tim and, and Zero Mistel and smashed them together. What would it look like? Uh, we've been lucky, like, and we, we, yeah. we, you know, Travis always pushes us to, to, you know, 
reach out for the best actors we can think of. And yeah. uh, we've gotten a lot of yeses from, from really good people. Yeah, I mean, we both had our little wish list of who we thought would fit well for the characters in the cast. Uh, but honestly, you know, Sir, Sir Ben Kingsley was on that list for the villain, but both Tony and I didn't think really do. think he'd do it. I mean, he didn't really have a history of doing a lot of voice work or, or animated features, but why not try at least? And lo and behold, he, he did agree to do it. Uh, and so we started to get all our ducks in a row to be prepared for, for Sir Ben Kingsley. Uh, and, you know, we had conversations with him and then had our script and we had our storyboards and we sort of figured out, we, we were pretty sure we knew exactly what we wanted out of our villain. Uh, but when you arrived for the very first recording session with Sir Ben Kingsley. What started coming out of his mouth was not at all what we expected. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he just took the characters to yeah. such a singular place that it was really, at first I was intimidated. I was like, I don't know if that's going to work. But it was the first recording session, you know, where he was these long, elongated vowels and where he sort of makes himself sound like a theatrical aristocrat. Uh, but it was the first one, and I said I wanted to know that this was we could work together. And work, but when I brought that first recording session home, I was really happy when uh, Travis and Graham. Yeah, when we to heard it, it immediately, it was like, wow, we've got something really special here. And he he just brought a whole other level to the character, which, in our minds, made him a lot more memorable. I think he's just he's he's, he's such a fun puppet to watch in the film, and I don't, it just feels like it's on the level of like the child catcher from Chitty Chitty yeah. Bang Bang or the Wicked, Witch, Wicked of Witch of the West. It's like it's, it went into a whole territory we never anticipated being in. So yeah, and before you even reach out to those guys, you start out with like we we always loved Isaac. Elle was a friend of the studio through her sister Dakota being in Coraline. Mm -hmm. So we we kind of had those two that we really liked before we'd actually reached out to them. So when we take those two, we take voice um, versions of their voice from all their different movies and we intercut them even though the dialogue doesn't make sense. So we did that, and that way you try to put the whole band together, what the whole movie sounds like. And it's really trying to figure out what is the saxophone, what is the drums. <laughs> so Nick Frost, Richard Iwade, Simon Pegg, we cut all these dialogue sequences of these guys, the nonsensical dialogue and stuff. And it really felt like it, it sort of blended together nicely. But a few places, um, especially... Um, Sir Ben and Tracy Morgan. Mm -hmm. Tracy Morgan was out of left field and he would come into the <laughs> stuff and we talked to him. He said he'd work on his English accent because he, really he, really, he really wanted to work with Sir Ben. He was like, and he would constantly say it. I'm in a movie with Sir Ben Kingsley. And stuff, but he would go, here's my English accent. And he would talk exactly the way he always talks. <laughs> How did you like that? We go, that's great. That's great. You sound like Michael Caine. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, uh, and at first we thought we were getting a very limited amount of time with Tracy because he's so busy and stuff. So the initial idea was that he would have a catchphrase where he would just say very nice and a lot in every different emotional way you could like angrily and happily yeah he was only going to say those two words the entire film but after the very first yeah. session with him it was that would be obvious to waste. us that it would yeah it would have been a huge waste of his yeah. talents and, and and we started to find ways to bring a lot more of mr gristle into the movie and i'm very happy we did yeah and nick frost and, and richard i what is just they were luckily for us and for the project we recorded them together pretty early on and we heard their interaction and how they were able to play off each other's timing in improv stuff so you know, it made us expand pickles and trout's role and then also um let those guys make up some more stuff mm -hmm. yeah. was, was ben also the voice of uh, uh, madame Fruvu? Mm -hmm. he invented madame Fruvu's speaking voice Okay. And he did a version of her singing that inspired Sean Patrick Doyle, the guy who actually sang the Madame Fufu song. He sort of inspired her, him, to, to do that role. But he gave us the version of the singing stuff, but Sean Patrick was able to add a I tunefulness mean, to it. He's a Broadway he's singer. He's a Broadway singer. He's got a lot like, more yeah. heft to his voice and stuff. Mm -hmm. Very nice. And the Eric Idle song? Yeah, well, that was funny because we always pitched it as it's as if Monty Python made Oliver Twist. Mm -hmm. So we always said that's the tone of the movie and stuff. So then when it came time to write a song in the middle of it, we said, why not go to the man himself who's written so many of those classic Monty Python? He was intrigued. You know, he loved the idea of Fru Fru, uh, you know, Sir Ben in a dress singing to the crowd. But he also liked the political undertones. I mean, there's always been a serious edge to the satire in Monty Python. And I don't think if it had just been a silly gag, it would have interested him that much. But he liked that idea of... of the political overtones of Snatcher sort of demonizing this whole community to get more power for himself. Mm -hmm. And he liked that part of it. And um, there's a great thing on the EPK where he talks about how he came about writing the song and stuff. So Yeah, it was kind of, uh, that was one of the, you know, there's many amazing moments along the whole project. But uh, yeah, being on the phone talking to Eric Idle on a conference call and 
you know, he, him agreeing to doing the song, and we're filling him in on all the details. And and then within like a couple of days, he came. He back came right back, in the and gym. he's playing the song weird. over the phone. And it's like it, the lyrics were pretty much where we went with it exactly. I mean, it was unbelievable his talent and the ability to absorb everything we said and then I know we actually felt kind of guilty he's like come on fellas give me the notes what do you need here we're like well, we kind of like it the way it is <laughs> he was um, great last question we were Angela was asking earlier and, and I had <clears throat> when we were watching the movie how did eggs learn to speak? So <laughs> <laughs> that was in very many of those scripts. I can't tell you how many times we yeah. boarded eggs, listening at the pipes to people talking above ground, finding a book on how to learn how to read and stuff. They have a record player down there. I think that he probably listened to more records than that song, which was written by yeah. uh, Dario Marinelli. If you know, it's four really yeah. famous opera singers in London singing the names of Italian cheeses. That's what all yeah. that oh, opera every is. Word is. Just <laughs> Italian, every word is cheese. Yeah. Okay. Will there be like a little bit of spinoffs of this in terms of um, you know so. web? Oh, or, you know, oh, I don't think so. Oh, I don't know. Um, right yeah. now, we, I think we, we told as much of the story we could in the okay. feature right now. Mm -hmm. and Travis has, is a little adverse to ideas yeah. of, of sequels and mm -hmm. prequels and that kind of stuff. We wanted to pick the most pivotal moment in these characters' lives and, and, and show you that. There are two more books, though. Okay. <laughs> so maybe some more sequels? Two more books. I think there'll only ever be books. <laughs> <laughs> Not this little Seven black dog. <laughs> <laughs> My life's Thank too you. short. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone.